Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you here today to talk about the responsibilities of directors of companies listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Now I have some exciting news. We're honored to have with us Mr. John Witts, the head of enforcement of the listing division of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, to share some thoughts with us by way of introduction. Over to John. Thanks very much, Julia. Uh, it's a, it's a very uh, much a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Julia for bringing this series to everyone, making it available to everyone. I think it's a fantastic series of topics and uh, an honor for me to have a chance to just say a few words of introduction. When we are looking at uh, enforcement action, will invariably there'll be some sign that the company may have fallen into, into a breach. There'll be some sort of uh, failure to comply with a rule requirement somewhere or another. But we don't normally stop there. Uh, in this day and age, it's all about individual accountability. If the company has fallen into breach, we need to ask the question about why that company has fallen into breach, and more importantly, who has allowed the company to fall into breach. And first and foremost, we'll be looking at the directors. And so that's why I think the understanding that you'll hopefully get from this presentation from Julia about directors' responsibilities under the listing rules is absolutely critical for us from an enforcement perspective. That said, it's not just directors as well. The directors may have primary responsibility for looking after the company and making sure that it doesn't fall into breach. But they're supported by all sorts of people from the senior management within the company, their advisors. And there are a lot of people who contribute to making sure that the company stays on the right path. And all of them have an important role to play. And part of our investigation can look at all of those. And so whether your role is as a director yourself, whether you're an advisor to a director, it's, uh, it's really critical that you understand what your responsibilities are or what the director's responsibilities are in order to ensure listing rule compliance. As for what we're looking for, I mean, it could be anything in every different case, but really the one thing that we, we really want to see is the right mindset from those who are responsible for the issuer. It doesn't mean you're going to get off scot-free if you just show you've got the right mindset, if you've, got, if you've allowed the company to fall into breach, but it's going to help you very, very much to be able to show that you are cooperating with whatever investigation that we're undertaking, that you recognize where things have fallen short, that you're proactively taking steps, ideally before things go wrong, to make sure that things don't go wrong, or if they have gone wrong, to make sure that things go right. And there's all sorts of resources and materials out there to try and help people to do that. The listing rules are a very long document. I don't expect necessarily everyone to go and remember every single word, but there are all sorts of materials out there which uh, help to train you or advice that you can get to try and make sure that everything stays, uh, as I say, on the right path. Um, so with that, very much like to just hand back over to Julia to, to take you forward with all the responsibilities and duties that a director have. Wish you all the very best of luck with it. And I hope that we don't have to cross paths, but uh, we are here to help educate the market as well. It's not just to try and to beat people when they've gone wrong. And so um, please uh, we welcome your participation in, the, in this. And, and thank you again to Julia for, for bringing this presentation and making it available to everyone. Thank you. Thanks so much, Don. Uh, it's great you're able to join and um, it's wonderful to hear your perspective on this subject and also be reminded how important this topic is really to maintain the importance and the integrity of the Hong Kong market, uh, which is so important to all of us. So turning now to the webinar, the obligations of directors of companies listed on the main board and gem are virtually identical in the context of directors duties. The principal difference being that quarterly financial reporting is mandatory for gem listed companies, but a recommended best practice only under the corporate governance code for main board listed companies. So while I'll be talking about main board companies, most of what I say about the obligations of directors also applies to the directors of gem listed companies. Today, I'm going to be looking at the sources of directors' obligations, disclosure obligations, and in particular, the obligation to disclose price sensitive information that's also known as inside information under part 14A of the SFO. So turning first to the major sources of directors' obligations, the directors of a company listed on the Hong Kong Exchange are subject to a number of obligations under Hong Kong's regulatory regime, which are derived from statute and non-statutory rules and codes. And these include common law and applicable Hong Kong legislation, including the company's winding up and miscellaneous provisions ordinance, the old CAP 32, the new company's ordinance, CAP 622, and the Securities and Futures Ordinance, CAP 571. The rules governing the listing of securities on the main board and the GEM rules of the exchange, together they're obviously the listing rules, and those include the Corporate Governance Code, 
and the model code for securities transactions by directors of listed companies. There's also the SFC's code on takeovers and mergers and code on share buybacks and the declaration and undertaking form B of Appendix 5 to the listing rules which each director of a company listed on the main board is required to lodge with the exchange. And you can also make reference to the guide on director's duties issued by the company's registry. A listed company undertakes in its application for listing to comply with the listing rules once its, share, its shares are listed on the exchange. So under listing rule 1304, the directors of a listed company are collectively and individually responsible for ensuring that the listed company complies fully with the requirements of the listing rules. The directors of a company listed on the main board are required to file with the exchange a declaration and undertaking in the form of Form B of Appendix 5 to the listing rules or Form H of Appendix 5 to the listing rules for Chinese companies and also provide their contact information as set out in Listing Rule 320, Subsection 1. In Form B of Appendix 5 to the listing rules, a director undertakes to comply to the best of their ability with the listing rules and use their best endeavours to ensure that the listed company complies. They have to comply to the best of their ability and use their best endeavours to ensure the listed company complies with the requirements of the various ordinances, the company's ordinance, the company's winding up miscellaneous provisions ordinance, Part 14A, that's inside information, of the SFO and Part 15 of the SFO, which sets out the requirements in relation to the disclosure of interests and the shares and debentures of the listed company and its associated companies, the takeovers code, the code on share buybacks, and all other relevant securities laws and regulations in force in Hong Kong. And they must also cooperate in any investigation conducted by the listing division and or the listing committee of the exchange. Any director who breaches any of these undertakings will be subject to sanctions prescribed by the listing rules. The rules require directors, both collectively and individually, to fulfill fiduciary duties and duties of skill, care and diligence to a standard at least commensurate with the standard established by Hong Kong law. According to Rule 308 of the listing rules, this means that every director must, in the performance of their duties as a director, act honestly and in good faith in the interests of the company as a whole, act for a proper purpose, be answerable to the listed company for the application or misapplication of assets, avoid actual and potential conflicts of interest and duty, disclose fully and fairly their interests in contracts with the listed company, and apply such degree of skill, care and diligence as may reasonably be expected of a person of their knowledge and experience holding office within the listed company. Listing Rule 308 also requires directors to take an active interest in the company's affairs obtain a general understanding of its business and follow up on anything untoward that comes to their attention. Delegating is allowed, but it doesn't absolve directors from their responsibilities or from applying the required degree of skill, care and diligence. Section 4651 of the company's ordinance codifies directors' duties of skill, care and diligence as summarized in paragraph F of Listing Rule 308 which says that a director must apply such degree of skill, care and diligence which can be reasonably expected from a person with a particular director's knowledge and experience. For example, a lawyer who's a director would be expected to bring their knowledge of the law to their role as a director. Section 4652 adopts a mixed objective and subjective test, that being the standard of care, skill and diligence required is that which would be exercised by a reasonably diligent person with the general knowledge, skill and experience that may reasonably be expected of a person carrying out the functions carried out by the director. That's the objective test. And the general knowledge, skill and experience that the particular director actually has. That's the subjective test. This is a minimum standard that can't be adjusted downwards to accommodate a person who's incapable of attaining even the basic standard of what is reasonably expected of a reasonably diligent person carrying out the same function. The subjective test means that where a person has been appointed as a director because they have some special skill, knowledge or experience, for example an accountant, a higher standard of care, skill and diligence will be required of that director compared to directors without such special skill, knowledge or experience. And this is why it's very worrying for a lawyer, for example, to become a director, as the standard of care, skill and diligence expected of them will be significantly higher, certainly in relation to legal matters, than it would be for a lay person or other professional. 
While Section 4652 of the Companies Ordinance doesn't apply directly to the directors of companies incorporated outside of Hong Kong, for example, Cayman or mainland China, the directors of a non-Hong Kong company which is listed on the exchange must comply with it since they're required by Rule 308 to exercise duties of skill, care and diligence to the standards set by Hong Kong law. In January 2020, the Exchange's Listing Committee criticised directors of Asia Resources Holdings for breach of listing Rule 308F for failing to exercise sufficient skill, care and diligence in relation to the acquisition of a spring water mine business. The case concerned the company's 244 million Hong Kong dollar acquisition of a 67% stake in a water mine business which was engaged in extraction, production and sales of spring water in Hunan. The relevant factors were that the target hadn't yet commenced business, the bottled water business was a new business to Asia Resources Holdings and none of the directors had experience in this type of business. Despite the directors asserting that they had relied on the professional parties instructed by them and on the documents provided by the vendor, the listing committee concluded that the directors had breached their duties under Rule 308F due to their failure to exercise independent judgment or take steps to verify the documents provided by the vendor, their excessive reliance on a valuation report when it was not reasonable to do so, and failing to procure sufficient professional advice in relation to the acquisition. The listing committee stressed the importance of directors exercising their fiduciary duties and duties of skill, care and diligence to a sufficiently high standard when making investment decisions on behalf of a listed company, particularly as the board is entrusted with public funds. It emphasised the need for directors to ensure that proper and adequate due diligence is done in respect of any potential investments, particularly where the investment is in a new business area for the company. Now let's go into the details of the possible consequences of non-compliance with the listing rules. Under listing rule 2A09, if a director breaches any of the listing rules, the exchange may respond with disciplinary procedures, including but not limited to issuing a private reprimand, issuing a public statement which involves criticism, issuing a public censure, reporting the offender's conduct to a regulatory authority, for example the SFC, or to an overseas regulatory authority, requiring a breach to be rectified or other remedial action taken within a stipulated period, and taking or refraining from taking such other action as the exchange thinks fit. For example, they may be ordered to take CPD training courses. Under listing rule 6011, the exchange may direct a trading halt or suspend dealings in the company's shares or cancel the listing of the company's shares if it considers it necessary to protect investors or maintain an orderly market. It may do so where it considers that the number of the company's publicly held shares is insufficient the company doesn't have sufficient operations or assets to warrant continuing listing, or the company or its business is no longer suitable for listing. Suitable these days is a very broadly interpreted term by the exchange. Directors should also be aware that it's a criminal offence under Section 384 of the SFO to intentionally or recklessly provide any information which is false or misleading in a material particular in any public disclosure document filed with the exchange or the SFC. And this could include any document filed under the listing rules um, continuing disclosure obligations, such as a submission. This has led some people to question whether it isn't better not to make an announcement at all than make one where you're not 100% sure it's correct. Under Section 214 of the SFO, the court may make orders disqualifying a person from being a director of any company for up to 15 years if they're found to be wholly or partly responsible for the misconduct of a company's affairs. Misconduct for these purposes will include where shareholders have not been given all the information with respect to the company's business or affairs which they might reasonably expect. The Stock Exchange published a consultation paper on the 7th of August with proposals to enhance its ability to regulate breaches of the listing rules and impose sanctions by expanding the circumstances in which a statement can be made, clarifying 
that a statement can be made after an individual no longer holds office as a director and widening the application to senior management as well. Currently, under Listing Rule 2A097, in the case of willful and persistent failure by a director of a listed company to discharge their responsibilities under the listing rules, the exchange can issue a statement to state publicly that in the exchange's opinion, the retention of office by the director is prejudicial to the interests of investors. Following such a statement, it's then for the listed company's board and shareholders to take appropriate action. This type of statement has rarely been used by the exchange, due in part to the fact that it can only be imposed in circumstances involving willful or persistent failure in the discharge of a director's responsibilities, which doesn't necessarily cover many instances of misconduct. The wording of the listing rules also suggests that it can only be used where a director remains on the board, when in practice directors will often have already resigned when the disciplinary action is taken. Further, this kind of statement can be used in relation to directors, but not members of senior management. The exchange also proposes to be able to direct follow-on action, notably suspending or cancelling a company's listing, where the individual in question remains a director or senior manager. The exchange also proposes that it should be able to publicly issue a director unsuitability statement this would be a notice that the individual is unsuitable to act as a director or member of senior management of the listed company or of any of its subsidiaries. Under Listing Rule 309A, in accepting to be a director of a listed company, directors will be considered to have irrevocably appointed the listed company as their agent for so long as they remain directors of the listed company for receiving any correspondence from the exchange. So if something arrives at the company, they're deemed to have received it. And authorizing the disclosure of any of their personal particulars to members of the listing committee and with the approval of the chairman or deputy chairman of the exchange to such other people as the executive director of listing may from time to time think fit. After appointment, Directors of a listed company are required to inform the exchange as soon as reasonably practicable of their contact details and correspondence address and must also inform the exchange of any changes for, for so long as they remain a director and in fact for three years after they stop being a director. If they don't do this, then of course they may not be alerted to proceedings commenced against them by the exchange. Turning now to directors' liability for misstatements in prospectuses. The listing rules require a listed company's directors to take full responsibility for the contents of a prospectus. The prospectus must contain a responsibility statement, which you can see set out on this slide. So the directors, having made all reasonable inquiries, confirm that to the best of their knowledge and belief, the information contained in the prospectus is accurate, complete in all material respects, not misleading or deceptive, and there are no other matters the omission of which would make any statement therein misleading. So untrue statements contained in a prospectus or the omission of certain material information may result in criminal and or civil liability for the company's directors. The principal areas of liability include Section 342E of the company's Winding Up and Miscellaneous Provisions Ordinance. This imposes civil liability for prospectus misstatements on specified people, including directors. Section 342F of the company's Winding Up and Miscellaneous Provisions Ordinance imposes criminal liability for prospectus misstatements on people who authorize the issue of a prospectus, which can also include directors. There's Section 1081 of the Securities and Futures Ordinance, which imposes civil liability for making any fraudulent, reckless or negligent misrepresentation which induces others to invest money. Sections 277 and 281 of the SFO impose civil liability for disclosing false or misleading information to induce dealings in shares. Section 391 of the SFO imposes civil liability for false or misleading public communications to induce dealings in shares. Section 107 of the Securities and Futures Ordinance imposes criminal liability for making any fraudulent or reckless misrepresentation to induce others to deal in shares. Section 298 of the SFO 
imposes criminal liability for disclosure of false or misleading information to induce dealings. I'm carrying on. Section 384 of the SFO imposes criminal liability for provision of false or misleading information in a prospectus or other document filed with the exchange or the SFC. Section 390 of the SFO states that where it's proved that an offence committed by a company under Part 14 of the SFO was aided, abetted, counseled, procured or induced by or committed with the consent or connivance of or attributable to the recklessness of an officer of the company or any person who is acting in such a capacity, that person as well as the company is guilty of an offence. Section 391 of the SFO entitles investors to seek compensation for losses arising from reliance on false or misleading public communications. A person who issues or makes a false or misleading communication to the public concerning shares or futures contracts or which may affect their price knowing or being reckless or negligent as to whether the communication is false or misleading in any material particular can be liable to pay compensation to any person for any financial loss resulting from relying on that communication. Liability can also arise, of course, under the misrepresentation ordinance or the theft ordinance or in tort or in general contract law. Many of the court decisions involving false and misleading information in companies' IPO prospectuses have been brought by the SFC under Section 213 of the SFO, which allows the SFC to apply to the court of first instance for a broad range of orders where a person has contravened any provision of the SFO or any provision of the prospectus regime in the company's ordinance. The SFC has used Section 213 to provide compensation to IPO investors who suffer financial loss due to false or misleading information contained in a company's IPO prospectus. It achieves this using restoration orders, which require the listed company to offer to buy back shares from IPO subscribers and secondary market purchasers, or orders requiring defendants to pay to the counterparties to the relevant transactions the difference between the value of the shares on the day of the transaction and the actual transaction price. In a landmark ruling, the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong dismissed Tiger Asia's appeal against compensation orders and confirmed that courts are entitled to make orders under Section 213 of the SFO without there having been any prior finding of either civil or criminal misconduct under the SFO by a criminal court or civil proceedings before the Market Misconduct Tribunal in Hong Kong. For the SFC, this is of course a more convenient route to obtaining compensation for investors as it gives a means to provide compensation to investors without the need to establish criminal liability for offences such as 342F of the company's winding up and miscellaneous provisions ordinance, which has to be proved beyond reasonable doubt or require the establishment of intent or recklessness. An example of the SFC's use of Section 213 is Kunsing Paper Holdings, which listed on the main board in 2007. The listed group's sales had been materially overstated in the prospectus and in its annual results and results announcements between 2007 to 2011, and there had also been a failure to disclose the group's bank borrowings. Kun Singh was found to have breached Sections 277 and 298 of the SFO by issuing false or misleading information that was likely to induce people to subscribe for its shares. It was also found to have contravened Section 384 for providing false or misleading information to the exchange and the SFC in purported compliance with a legal requirement, and Section 342F of the company's ordinance, which prohibits making untrue statements in a prospectus. The defendants were ordered to pay 1.42 billion Hong Kong dollars to Kun Sing shareholders and holders of its unlisted warrants. Listed companies and their directors have also been prosecuted, although not always successfully, for false information included in company announcements published under the listing rules under Section 384 of the SFO. An example is PME Group, which was convicted in 2013 under Section 384 for providing false or misleading information to the exchange in three announcements published in response to the exchange's inquiries about a 136% increase 
in the company's share price in February 2008. PME pleaded guilty and was fined 60,000 Hong Kong dollars. A director of PME was also charged with breach of Section 384, but was acquitted as it wasn't established that she had the requisite criminal intent. Well, as I'm sure you all know, in Hong Kong, a company's prospectus is pretty much the sole document by which a company sells its shares in a Hong Kong IPO. However, any other additional document by which shares are offered to the public could also constitute a prospectus under Hong Kong law. For example, a brochure could be considered as a prospectus or part of a prospectus, and if so, would be required to comply with all applicable requirements. These include the prospectus content requirement, the translation requirements, the registration requirement. And to avoid the risk of liability, directors and senior management need to be careful that no material information about the company or its shares is provided generally, and in particular to any investment research analyst, unless the information is reasonably expected to be included in the prospectus or it's already publicly available. When assessing whether any such information is material information, the test should be applied is as to whether the information is material to an investor in forming a valid and justifiable opinion of the company and its financial condition and profitability. This restriction covers any information provided to other people, including an analyst, as I've mentioned, directly or indirectly, formally or formally, in writing or verbally, or it covers all communications in a meeting, during a presentation, sent by WeChat, sent by WhatsApp, a site visit, an interview or Zoom call, or any other context. So it's very important that no additional material, non-public information is provided to other people, including analysts. In the case of disclosure, whether intentional or not, and often that may be to analysts, the company could be compelled to disclose this information in a prospectus. And in such case, if the information, of course, may not be appropriate to be included in a prospectus and may not be verifiable, this could cause other problems and issues for the company. So what are the consequences of including information in the prospectus? Well, they are that any untrue statement, including any statement that's false, misleading, or deceptive in a prospectus, may give rise to criminal and civil liability, including personal liability of each director and any other person who authorized the issue of the prospectus. And the directors must likewise take personal liability for the truthfulness, accuracy, and completeness of any information the company may be compelled under the SFC rules to include in a prospectus under these circumstances. In the case of an IPO, a company is strongly advised to seek the guidance and assistance of its sponsors, its Hong Kong legal advisors, if there are any uncertainties. And this is part of the reason, of course, for the research blackout period, to avoid research being too close to the date of the prospectus. Turning now to the disclosure of price-sensitive information. The statutory regime governing listed companies' disclosure of price-sensitive information, which is also referred to in the legislation as inside information, is set out in Part 14A of the Securities and Futures Ordinance. The SFC's guidelines on disclosure of inside information give some examples in relation to complying with this disclosure obligation. The regime under the SFO creates a statutory obligation on companies to disclose inside information to the public as soon as reasonably practicable, after the inside information has come to their knowledge. Breaches are dealt with by the Market Misconduct Tribunal, the MMT, which can impose a number of civil sanctions. There are certain key elements of the regime, which include the application of an objective test in determining whether information is inside information, whether a reasonable person acting as an officer of the company would consider that the information is inside information in relation to the company. There's an obligation on a company to disclose inside information as soon as reasonably practicable after it comes to the knowledge of the company. That's after the information has or reasonably to have come to the knowledge of an officer of the company and that, of course, would include a director, in the course of performing their functions as an officer or director of the company. There's an obligation on the directors and officers of a company to take all reasonable measures to ensure that proper safeguards exist to prevent the company breaching the statutory disclosure requirement. 
For directors and officers of a company to be individually liable for the company's breach of the statutory disclosure obligation, or if the breach is a result of any intentional, reckless or negligent conduct or failure to ensure proper safeguards on their part. There are also provision of safe harbours for legitimate circumstances where non-disclosure or late disclosure is allowed. The SFC can rely on its powers under the SFO to investigate suspected breaches and to institute proceedings directly before the Market Misconduct Tribunal. A company or officer found to have breached the statutory disclosure requirement may be liable to pay compensation to anyone who has suffered financial loss as a result of a breach, provided it's fair, just and reasonable that they should do so. So what's the definition of inside information? It's defined in Section 307A of the SFO as specific information that is about the company, a shareholder or officer of the company, or the listed shares of the company or their derivatives, and is not generally known to the person who is accustomed or would be likely to deal in the listed shares of the company, but would have generally known to them be likely to materially affect the price of the listed shares. The inside information which a company is required to disclose is the same information that is prohibited from being used for dealing in the shares of the company under the insider dealing regime, which is under parts 13 and 14 of the SFO. So the key elements of the definition are threefold. The information must be specific. The information must not be generally known to that segment of the market which deals or which would be likely to deal in the company's shares. And the information would, if generally known, be likely to have a material effect on the price of the company's shares. The SFC guidelines provide guidance as to how these terms have been interpreted by the MMT in the past. So let's look at the key elements of the definition. Information that's specific. The information must be capable of being identified, defined and unequivocally expressed. Information regarding a company's affairs will be sufficiently specific if it carries with it such particulars as to a transaction, event or matter, or proposed transaction, event or matter, so as to allow that transaction, event or matter to be identified and its nature to be coherently understood. I always find this quite hard because while the information has to be specific, it doesn't need to be precise. Information may be specific even though the particulars or details aren't precisely known. For example, Information that a company is in financial difficulty or proposes to conduct a share placing would be regarded as specific, even if the details aren't known. Information on a transaction that's only contemplated or under negotiation and not yet subject to a final agreement can be specific information. To constitute specific information, a pro proposal should also be beyond the stage of a vague exchange of ideas or a fishing expedition. If negotiations or contracts have already taken place, there should be a substantial commercial reality to the negotiations, which should be at the stage where the parties intend to negotiate with a re realistic view of achieving a an identifiable goal. Mere rumours, vague hopes or worries, wishful thinking, and unsubstantiated conjecture are not specific information. So all of this is not terribly concrete when you're actually having to make a decision about what needs to be disclosed. And I think you'll see that many Hong Kong listed companies tend to err on the side of caution and make more rather than less announcements than perhaps might be made in other markets. For example, it's quite frequent that a memorandum of understanding might be disclosed in our market, whereas that's not the invariable practice in other markets. So what is meant by not generally known? The SFC guidelines note that rumours, media speculation and market expectation about an event or circumstance of a company can't be equated with information which is generally known to the market. There's a clear distinction between the market having actual knowledge of a hard fact, which has been properly disclosed by the company, and speculation or expectation as to an event or circumstance which will require proof. In determining whether information that's the subject of media comments or analysts' reports or is on a news service is considered to be generally known, a company should consider the accuracy, completeness and reliability of this information, and not only 
on how widely the information has been disseminated. Where the information has only been partly disseminated or the dissemination is incomplete or there are material omissions or there are doubts as to its bona fides, the information can't be regarded as generally known and the company is required to make a full disclosure. So the next part of the definition is likely to have a material effect on the price of the listed securities. Whether inside information is likely to materially affect the price of a company's shares is judged based on whether the inside information would influence people who are accustomed to or would be likely to deal in the company's shares in deciding whether or not to buy or sell their shares. The test is necessarily a hypothetical one and it has to be applied at the time the information becomes available. Timing. A company has to disclose inside information to the public as soon as reasonably practicable after any inside information has come to its knowledge. That's section 307b1 of the SFO. And inside information is taken to have come to a company's knowledge if the inside information has or reasonably to have come to the knowledge of an officer of the company in the course of performing their functions as an officer of the company. So if somebody who's a director actually receives the information as a shareholder, then that may not necessarily have come to the company, although the person himself would be in a difficult position. A reasonable person acting as an officer of the company would consider that the information is inside information in relation to the company. Companies therefore must ensure that they have effective systems and procedures in place to make sure that any material information which comes to the knowledge of any of their officers is promptly identified and escalated to the board to determine whether it needs to be disclosed. According to the SFC guidelines, the term as soon as reasonably practicable means that the company should immediately take all steps that are necessary in the circumstances to disclose the information to the public. The necessary steps that a company should take immediately before the publication of an announcement may include ascertaining sufficient details, internal assessment of the matter and its likely impact, seeking professional advice where required and verification of the facts. The company has to ensure that the information is kept strictly confidential until it's publicly disclosed. If the company believes that the required degree of confidentiality can't be maintained or that there may have been a breach of confidentiality, it should immediately disclose the information to the public. That's under paragraph 41 of the SFC guidelines. The SFC's guidelines also raise the possibility of a company issuing a holding announcement to give the company time to clarify the details and likely impact of an event before issuing a full announcement. So what's the definition of an officer? Under the SFO, an officer is a director, manager, company secretary or any other person involved in a company's management. In the context of inside information disclosure, a manager is generally someone who holds a position under the immediate authority of the board and they have management responsibility affecting the whole or a substantial part of the company. The information which has to be disclosed is that which becomes known in situations where the officer is acting in their capacity as an officer. Inside information has to be disclosed by way of publication of an announcement on the websites of the exchange and the listed company in accordance with Listing Rule 207C. This is required by Listing Rule 13092A. Publication on the exchange's website fulfills the requirement of 307C1 of the SFO that disclosure of inside information must be made in a manner that can provide for equal, timely and effective access by the public to the information disclosed. Additional means can also be used to disseminate the inside information such as press releases through news or wire services, press conferences in Hong Kong, social media, posting an announcement on a company's own website, but that has to be in addition to the announcement on the exchange's website. If a company is listed on more than one stock exchange, the inside information has to be disclosed to the public in Hong Kong at the same time as it's released to overseas markets. If inside information is released to an overseas market while the Hong Kong market's closed, the company should issue an announcement in Hong Kong before the Hong Kong market opens for trading. If necessary, the company can request a suspension of trading in its shares pending issue of the announcement in Hong Kong. 
The information contained in an announcement of inside information must be complete and accurate in all material respects and not be misleading or deceptive, whether by omission or otherwise. So what are the safe harbours? Section 307D of the SFO provides four safe harbours to allow companies not to disclose or to delay publication of inside information. Except for safe harbour A, companies may only rely on the safe harbours if they've taken reasonable precautions to preserve the confidentiality of the inside information and the inside information has not in fact leaked. So safe harbour A is where disclosure would breach an order by a Hong Kong court or any provisions of other Hong Kong statutes. This grants a safe harbour to companies if they're prohibited from disclosing inside information under a Hong Kong court order or any Hong Kong statute. For example, I was involved in a matter relating to a mining company listed on the Hong Kong Exchange a few years ago, and there was an inadvertent leak of cyanide into a river in mainland China. And there arose a complete contradiction between a PRC court order, which ordered the company in the short term not to disclose the leak of cyanide, and Hong Kong obligations, which clearly compelled disclosure as it was material. Safe Harbor B is the one most used and applies where the information relates to an incomplete proposal or negotiation. The SFC guidelines give some examples. When a contract is being negotiated but it hasn't been finalized. When a company decides to sell a major holding in another company. When a company is negotiating a share placing with a financial institution. Or when a company is negotiating the provision of financing with a creditor. Where a company is in financial difficulty and is negotiating with third parties for funding, reliance on this safe harbour will mean that it will not be necessary to disclose the negotiations. The safe harbour does not, however, allow the company to withhold disclosure of any material change in its financial position or performance which led to the funding negotiations and to the extent that this is inside information should be the subject of an announcement. Safe Harbour C, where the information is a trade secret. There's no statutory definition of trade secret, but the SFC guidelines say that a trade secret generally refers to proprietary information owned by a company which is used in a trade or business of the company, which is confidential, it's not already in the public domain, which if disclosed to a competitor would be liable to cause real or significant harm to the company's business interests and the circulation of the information is contained to a limited number of people on a need-to-know basis. Trade secrets may concern inventions, manufacturing processes, or even customer lists. However, a trade secret doesn't cover the commercial terms and conditions of a contractual agreement or the financial information of a company, which can't be regarded as proprietary information or rights owned by the company. Lastly, Safe Harbor D. That's where the government's exchange fund or a central bank provides liquidity support to the company. Under this safe harbour, no disclosure is required for information concerning the provision of liquidity support in cases of usually, I suppose, systemic collapse to a company from the exchange fund of the government or from an institution which performs the functions of a central bank, including one located outside of Hong Kong. So except for safe harbour A, the safe harbours are only available if and so long as the company takes reasonable precautions for preserving the confidentiality of the information and the confidentiality of the information is in fact preserved. If confidentiality is lost or the information is leaked, the safe harbour will no longer be available and the company must disclose the inside information as soon as practicable. If confidentiality is lost, the company won't be regarded as in breach of the disclosure requirement in respect of inside information if it can show that it's taken all reasonable measures to monitor the confidentiality of the information and made disclosure as soon as reasonably practicable once it became aware that the confidentiality of the information had not in fact been preserved. The SFC can grant waivers where the disclosure of inside information in Hong Kong would be prohibited under a court order or legislation of another jurisdiction or would contravene a restriction imposed by a law enforcement agency or government authority in another jurisdiction. The SFC will grant waivers on a case-by-case -case basis and may attach conditions. A company must 
copy to the exchange any application made to the SFC for a waiver from the disclosure obligation and also the SFC's decision when received. Given how many companies in Hong Kong have businesses outside of Hong Kong, this is clearly quite an important provision. Liability of officers. The officers of a company are required to take all reasonable measures to ensure that proper safeguards exist to prevent the company's breach of the inside information disclosure requirement. Although a director's breach of the, this provision isn't actionable in and of itself, a director or an officer will be regarded as having breached the disclosure obligation if the listed company has breached the disclosure obligation and either the breach resulted from that officer, including a director's intentional, reckless or negligent conduct, or the officer or director hasn't taken all reasonable measures to ensure that proper safeguards exist to prevent the breach. In relation to officers and director's obligation to put in place all reasonable measures to ensure the existence of proper safeguards, the SFC guidelines focus on the responsibility of officers, including non-executive directors, to ensure that appropriate systems and procedures are put in place and periodically reviewed to enable the company to comply with the disclosure requirement. Officers with an executive role will also have a duty to oversee the proper implementation and functioning of the procedures and to ensure the detection and remedy of material deficiencies in a timely manner. The particular needs and circumstances of the listed company should be taken into account in establishing appropriate systems and procedures. The SFC guidelines provide a non-exhaustive list of examples of systems and procedures which listed companies should consider implementing. The Market Misconduct Tribunal can impose a number of penalties um, and you can see these on the slide and they include a fine of up to 8 million Hong Kong dollars on the company a director or chief executive, but not officers of the company. Disqualification of a director or officer from being a director or otherwise involved in the management of a company for up to five years. A cold shoulder order on a director or an officer. This would mean that they would be deprived of access to market facilities for dealing in securities, futures contracts and other investments for up to five years. A cease and desist order on the company, a director or officer, so that's an order that they do not breach a statutory disclosure requirement again. An order that any body or society or entity of which the director or officer is a member be recommended to take disciplinary action against them. And payment of costs of the civil inquiry or the SFC investigation by the company director or officer. To try and prevent the occurrence of further breaches of the disclosure requirement, the Market Misconduct Tribunal can also require the appointment of an independent professional advisor to review the company's procedures for disclosure of price-sensitive information, an advisor on matters relating to compliance, and they can require the officer or director to undertake a training program approved by the SFC on compliance with Part 14A of the SFO, Director's Duties and Corporate Governance. In addition, a company or officer found to be in breach of the statutory disclosure obligation may be found liable to pay compensation if it's fair, just and reasonable to any person who suffered financial loss as a result of the breach in separate proceedings brought by that person under Section 307Z of the SFO. So a decision by the Market Misconduct Tribunal that a breach of the disclosure requirement has taken place or identifying a person as being in breach of the requirement will be admissible in evidence in any proceedings to prove that the disclosure requirement has been breached or that the person in question has breached the requirement. The courts may also impose an injunction in addition to or in substitution for damages. The SFC is pretty diligent in pursuing cases of late disclosure of inside information and two particular examples were the civil proceedings brought in the Market Misconduct Tribunal for late disclosure of inside information against Fujicon Industrial Holdings and Magic Holdings International. So what are the roles and duties of each of the SFC and the exchange in this regard? Well, the SFC is responsible for enforcement of the statutory obligation to disclose inside information. Where the exchange is aware of a possible breach of the statutory disclosure obligation, the exchange will refer it to the SFC. 
the exchange will not take any disciplinary action itself under the rules unless the SFC considers it inappropriate to pursue the matter under the SFO and the exchange considers action under the rules for a possible breach of the rules to be in order. A company will not face enforcement action by the SFC and the exchange at the same time in respect of the same set of facts. There's an obligation also to avoid a false market. That's main board rule 13091. If in the exchange's view there is or is likely to be a false market in a listed company's shares, the company has to announce the information necessary to avoid a false market as soon as reasonably practicable after consultation with the exchange. A company is also required to contact the exchange as soon as reasonably practicable if it believes that there is likely to be a false market in its shares. Under Listing Rule 13092, where a company is required to disclose inside information under the SFO, it must simultaneously announce the information. A company is also required to copy to the exchange any application to the SFC for a waiver from the requirement to disclose inside information and their subsequent decision. Under Listing Rule 1310, if the exchange makes an inquiry to a company concerning unusual movements in the price or the trading volume of a company's listed shares, the possible development of a false market or any other matters, a company is required to respond promptly to the exchange in one of two ways. They have to provide to the exchange and if asked by the exchange, announce any information relevant to the matters which the exchange was asking about which they have, so as to inform the market and clarify the situation. And secondly, if appropriate and if requested by the exchange, they have to issue a standard announcement confirming that the directors, having made such inquiry with respect to the company as may be reasonable in all the circumstances, are not aware of any information that is relevant to the subject matter of the inquiry or of any inside information which needs to be disclosed under the SFO. The standard form of the announcement in response to this kind of inquiry is set out in Note 1 to Listing Rule 1310, which you can see on the slide. It says that the companies noted the recent increases, decreases, etc. The Board of Directors collectively and individually accept responsibility for the announcement, but they don't think that any information needs to be disclosed. Turning now to trading halts or suspensions. Listing Rule 1310A requires a company to request a trading halt or trading suspension if an announcement can't be made promptly in certain circumstances. Where a company has information which should be disclosed under Listing Rule 1309, that's information to avoid a false market, or a company reasonably believes that there's inside information which should be disclosed under Part 14A of the SFO, or inside information may have leaked, which is the subject of an application to the SFC for a waiver from compliance with the statutory disclosure obligation, or is exempt from the statutory disclosure obligation, except if the safe harbour on which um, reliance has been used for the exemption relates to disclosure being prohibited by Hong Kong law or order of a Hong Kong court. The exchange also has the right to direct a trading halt in a company's shares where there are unexplained movements in the price or trading volume of the company's listed shares, or where a false market for the trading of shares is developed and the company's authorised representative can't immediately be contacted to confirm that the company is not aware of any matter that's relevant to the unusual price movement or trading volume or the development of a false market. So they weren't able to make the sort of announcement which we were just looking at. The company delays in issuing an announcement in response to the inquiries from the exchange under listing rule 1310 or there is uneven dissemination or leakage of inside information in the market giving rise to an unusual movement in the price or trading volume of the company's listed shares. This brings me to the end of this presentation. Thank you for joining. I do hope that you enjoyed the webinar.